I'm Shana Swan, and I'm a professor in the Department of Environmental Medicine and Public Health at Mount Sinai. And I'm a um, reproductive and environmental epidemiologist. In 2017, we published a meta-analysis, um, which looked at sperm decline all over the world in 185 studies. And what we found was that sperm count had declined very significantly at the rate of over 50% at the rate of 1% per year. And um, this study um, went viral and it actually led to an agent coming to me and asking me if I write a book about it. And then my writing the book, which came out last week called Countdown. Yeah, so that what that meta analysis was not about, as you say, not about the causes of the decline. However, I and others have been working for about 20 years looking at causes of impaired semen quality. And that's count and the shape, morphology, and the mo motion, which is motility, which all can be impacted. And what my research has shown is that there are a number of chemicals in our daily lives that have the ability to lower sperm count and that there are lifestyle factors, things we do in our daily lives that also impact sperm count. So we have sort of two classes of explanations, the environmental chemicals particularly those that are hormonally active that can interfere with the body's hormones, which by the way, are called endocrine disrupting chemicals. That class of chemicals is particularly important in this discussion. And then we have the lifestyle factors, which are many things that affect our health more generally and also affect sperm count, such as obesity, smoking, binge drinking, stress, and obviously these are not only risky for sperm count. So endocrine disrupting chemicals, you break that down, endocrine, that means hormones and disrupting is interfering with and chemicals is clear. So endocrine disrupting chemicals are chemicals that have the ability to interfere with our body's natural endocrine system or the hormones in our body. For example, interfering with the production and the distribution of testosterone or estrogen or thyroid hormone. And actually there are hundreds of hormones in the body and we're only beginning to understand which ones are impacted by these chemicals. Um, so where we see these um, is actually everywhere. Um, and everyone sees them. So uh, the Centers for Disease Control measures these and other chemicals in people's bodies every two years, a representative sample of the US population gets tested. And then they publish these reports showing what the levels are. And the chemicals that I study most, which are the phthalates, which we could talk about what they are if you want, um, and also the bisphenols, they are present in over 90% of the US population. So there's a lot of them out there and they get into our homes, they get into our bodies through our products that we bring into our house and our food and sometimes our water and the products we use and the cosmetics we put on our face and so on and so forth. So we can talk about specific ones, but generally they're everywhere chemicals, all the time, everywhere chemicals, we can't avoid them. Wow, that is a huge question. <laughs> oh, okay, so I, I'm a reproductive epidemiologist, so I can tell you how they affect reproductive health. I also study neurodevelopment together with the Department of Psychiatry, and we study effects on children's neurodevelopment as well. However, other people study their effects on lots of other systems, for example, their relation to obesity, their relation to every aspect of human development, there's hardly anything that's not impacted by one or another of these endocrine disrupting chemicals. 
No, that's a great question. Um, and I'm glad you're asking about the fetus because even though you and I today are exposed to all these chemicals, if we're not pregnant, which I'm definitely not, um, it's not so risky. But if a young woman is pregnant, they are particularly risky. So they're risky because <clears throat> these chemicals get into our bodies. We know that because we measure them in the urine or in the blood. So we know they're in there and we know they get into the fetus and then they cause harm, particularly during the time that a individual developmental system is developing. So for example, I study the reproductive system a lot. And we know that in early pregnancy, the first part of the first trimester, that reproductive system that then the genitals are developing very, very rapidly. And so when a small amount of chemical gets in there that has the ability to interfere with the hormones that are needed for that production, okay? So the, the body needs, for example, the male needs a certain amount of testosterone at the right time to develop normally. If the mother is exposed to something that can decrease testosterone, which phthalates do, by the way, then her male child will not develop completely normally. He will be less completely masculinized. And at another time, the same chemicals might affect brain development and so on. So they're in there all the time. They're doing their damage to different systems at different times. The global production of plastics has accelerated even faster than 1% per year, which is the rate at which sperm decline and fertility and testosterone have been decreasing. So we have this steady drumbeat of increasing reproductive health accompanied by steady increase in production of chemicals and plastics in particular. And um, this took off after the Second World War um, and oil production increased then. And then it was discovered that the byproducts of oil production could be used to make plastic and to make these endocrine disrupting chemicals. And so it was a natural um, and people loved science at that time. They believed that science could bring us better living through chemistry. Um, that was a buzzword and people were incorporating as many of these products into their homes as they could. And there was no thought about any risk. I'm certainly glad that some and disrupting chemicals have been removed from child toys, children's toys and products. And I was actually active in that process because the results, I testified to the committee that was in charge of that, um, the um, Consumer Product Safety Commission. And um, I talked about the results we saw in our study and how these chemicals could harm the development of infant boys. Um, and so three phthalates were removed from commerce, that is particularly from children's toys. So this is a great start, but it's only a start for a couple of reasons. One is pregnant women don't play with children's toys by and large, unless they happen to have a small child in the house. So they're not protecting her. And perhaps more importantly, um, I have to just tell you a, an interesting finding with a sad ending. I did two studies. So the first study we recruited women in 2000, and in the second study, we recruited women in 2010, so 10 years later. And then we looked for phthalates in the urine of each group, and we found that very excitedly, excitingly, the level of the worst chemicals, the strongest endocrine disrupting chemicals, most able to lower testosterone, had dropped 50% in that time. So I was extremely ex happy about this. And I thought, well, I've done something. I've gotten these products out and women are now safer. But that conclusion was premature because I learned later in that study and in another study that I did in Sweden that these bad phthalates, if you will, had been replaced by others which could do the same harm. 
So it's a good news, bad news story. And we can't go on substituting. For example, everyone knows BPA is bad and many things are labeled BPA free, okay? But what's not known is that the BPA is replaced by another bisphenol, could be one called BPS as in Sam, BPF as in Frank, and they are also harmful. So the public is actually being tricked in a way. They think they're buying a safe product if it says BPA free, that's why they're buying it. And yet there's this other bisphenol that's not named, which is also risky. And the same thing happened with phthalates. So we call this regrettable substitution and it's going on all the time. It's been going on for as, as long as these chemicals have been manufactured. And, um, and so we can't really get ahead of the game this way. So if people are at risk of pregnancy, as we like to say, they might get pregnant, or if they actually are planning to get pregnant, these recommendations are particularly important. Um, and by the way, they're important for the man and the woman because the man is producing sperm all the time. And when he conceives a pregnancy, the sperm that was <laughs> conceiving that pregnancy was produced in the 70 days prior to conception. So it's pretty recent. And so in that time period, the man should have been very careful about his exposures. So what should he do and what should the woman do around that time or during her pregnancy? So I recommend that people, to the extent that they can afford it, eat unprocessed, and organic food. Unprocessed food is unlikely to be contaminated with phthalates and phenols and organic food is unlikely to be contaminated with pesticides and also pesticides contain phthalates. Um, so that's step number one. Number two, I would say do not store or warm food in plastic containers. This is really critical because when <clears throat> the plastic is warmed, the chemicals leave the plastic, they're not chemically bound and they enter the food and then they enter us. So keep food and plastic separate to the extent that you can. Um, I would say they avoid anything with fragrance like a car, tag that you know changes the odor in the car, uh, um, a plug-in, air freshener, and any scent in their personal care products and laundry products. Why? We asked women in our study what they used in the 24 hours before they gave a urine sample. And the number of fragrance products, we asked, asked them were the product, products fragrance, and the number of fragrance products was directly related to the amount of phthalates in their urine. So that's a, you know, a, an easy way to decrease your exposure. Um, also try to minimize the number of personal care products and cosmetics. And if you're concerned about a particular one, you can go to a consumer guide and there are many of them. One of them is Environmental Working Group has these, other um, companies, other uh, NGOs have these and look up safety of that product. And you can learn something about it before you use it or buy it. And I would recommend that people do that. Um, on the lifestyle end, um, definitely stop smoking. Um, there's no question that cigarette smoke is uh, harmful to the, the fetus. And uh, do not binge drink. Uh, mild alcohol is fine. Um, do not excessively use any recreational drugs and um, try to get exercise and worry a little bit about your weight if you're overweight. Um, again, I should point out there are sweet spots. We don't want people, you know, people who are very heavy have reduced fertility. People who are very thin also have reduced fertility. Same thing with exercise. If you overexercise as a woman, you can stop menstruating. Uh, as a man, you can decrease your fertility. 
but if you don't exercise at all, then you are also in some kind of trouble. So try to find the middle road for these exposures. And as far as stress goes, well, this is a stressful time and I hesitate to even say reduce your stress, but stress is related to fertility and sperm count. I don't think these changes will be enough. They'll certainly help. They help on an individual level. But in fact, I think the problem is bigger and it's not something as the saying is now, you can't shop your way out of this. You can't recycle your way out of this. So shopping sensibly is a good thing. Recycling is a good thing, no question about it. But as long as those chemicals are in the market, they will get into us. There's no way of avoiding it. They're not labeled um, and we can't stop that. What we have to stop is putting these chemicals into commerce and we have to replace them. We have to replace them, the companies have to replace them with other chemicals that serve the same purpose, if that's what we want in our daily lives, but are not hormonally active, not endocrine disruptors. And we didn't talk about this, but they shouldn't be harmful at very low doses because we're often exposed to very low doses and we know now that these are harmful. So we don't want chemicals that can be harmful at low doses. And we don't want chemicals that will stick around, that will persist in the environment, as we know many of these chemicals do. And um, that's a big job, but I believe we can do it if we have the will. And so I wrote Countdown and I'm talking to you and others um, whenever I can about this because I want people to be aware of the problem because the first step is awareness. And, and so I'm asking people if you can to read Countdown and if you wanna support it, go on social media, hashtag count me in and join this effort with me to make these changes. Well, I think I've laid out a, a really big program, uh, but let me say that along with the changes in the chemical industry and people's behaviors, we have to change regulations because as long as we're not regulating the thousands of chemicals that have been in the market before regulation like Tosca was put in place. Um, and as long as we allow chemicals to go in the market before they're tested for safety, unlike the EU, by the way, um, then we're not gonna get ahead of the game. So we need to remove the chemicals that are harmful. We need to replace them with safer chemicals and we need to regulate them properly. I'm hoping <clears throat> that Countdown will raise awareness of the problem, uh, get people concerned, worried, and move them to action. Um, and on a personal level, I hope it'll give people who are trying to get pregnant or maybe are pregnant some tips on to how to do this more safely. <laughs>